the hour record, Pogacar's Tour de France victories, Lizzie Diagnan becoming the first woman to win Paris-Roubaix, the Team Pursuit world records where they go more than 60 kilometers an hour. All of these are incredible feats, but none of them would have been possible were it not for the humble tire and the fascinating science behind them. Tires are hugely important and many other records such as land speed records would become much more within reach if specific tires for those applications existed. And in this video, we're going to explain just what tires do. Tires might look simple, but they're surprisingly complex. Something such as this Pirelli P0 actually has seven different mechanical components in its construction and many more chemical ingredients that go into things such as the rubber compound. So I'm going to explain why some tires cost more than others, why some have tread patterns and others don't, and also just how they work. I mean, what even is grip? Does anybody actually know? Well. Grip is defined as the coefficient of friction between the surface of the tyre and the surface of the road. This friction depends on an array of variables such as the roughness of the road and the type, temperature and therefore behaviour of the tyre rubber. Not now, suggestion boy. First, let's begin with the construction of the tyre and the different component parts. Now, as mentioned, tyres have different layers and the outer layer is known as the tread. This is the part of the tyre that makes contact with the road. You then have the bead. This runs on the edge of the tyre and holds it in place on the wheel rim, stopping it from popping off. Underneath the tread is often a belt of armour for puncture protection. This is typically made from armoured fibre or Kevlar, the same stuff they use in bulletproof vests. I wonder if tyres are bulletproof? Uh, I, I'm not sure about this. I, I don't think it's safe. Below the belt is the carcass, which is often made of nylon fibres. These nylon fibres are laid up in a specific direction and are often perpendicular to the tyre's direction of travel. This helps reduce rolling resistance, better absorb bumps in the road, and is one of the reasons why more expensive tyres are directional. Here you can see the carcass becoming exposed on one of my tires. This is because I've been pulling skids to impress the kids. Anyhow, riding a tire with the carcass showing like this is extremely dangerous and you shouldn't do it because you can have a blowout at any point. Speaking of which, if you need some fresh threads to cover your carcass, then why not head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork for the finest t-shirts and hoodies available to humanity, of course. But what about the composition of a tyre's compound? Well, it isn't just plain synthetic rubber or natural rubber on its own, because this stuff doesn't have the right material properties. Think of the, well, the rubber you'd use at school on your pencil homework or a razor if you're American. Instead, the rubber is made much tougher by a process known as vulcanization. This was actually given to us by a visitor from another planet called Spock from the planet Vulcan many years ago. Anyhow, it involves heating up rubber in the presence of sulfur, and this allows the different strands, polymer chains of the rubber to interlink together thanks to the sulfur. It's a bit like conga lines, all kind of like lining up and then like joining hands with the conga line. No, it's not really like that, but you get the idea. Anyhow, that was the original vulcanization process. But as technology has developed, manufacturers have started including many more additives as well as sulfur into their tire compounds to better tweak and manipulate the material properties. But what are these additives, I hear you ask? Well, a lot of them are closely guarded industrial secrets, but some are known about, and some brands even claim to put graphene into their tire compounds. Well-established additives include carbon powder. This is essentially the same thing as graphene. It's just not as sexy for marketing purposes because it didn't win a Nobel Prize. Anyhow, its main job is to protect the tire from UV damage and also give it its black color. Silica is often added to make tires quieter and reduce rolling resistance so that you can go faster for the same effort. Other compounds such as zinc oxide are added to accelerate the vulcanization. The more complex a tyre compound is to produce and the more ingredients it has, the more expensive it's going to be. Now, we return to grip. Now, grip, as mentioned, is the coefficient of friction between the road surface and the rubber of the tyre. Now, the coefficient of friction is a number. The smaller that number, the less energy required 
for two materials to slide past each other. So, for example, the coefficient of friction between rubber and ice is 0.15, which is a low number, and that's the reason why you don't dice with the ice, kids, and just, just stay at home, just go on the turbo. A waxed ski on ice is even lower, 0.05, whereas rubber on tarmac, or asphalt, if you're American, is 0.68. But it's not just the surfaces and the materials, it's also other environmental factors. So if you have wet tarmac, you're effectively adding a lubricant and reducing friction, in which case rubber on wet tarmac, or asphalt, becomes 0.53. But all these numbers are just approximations because changing the surface finish of materials also affects friction. For example, if you had a super smooth tarmac road, that's gonna have lower friction and be faster. But you can't go too far. So if you had like, I don't know, super smooth steel tires and a super smooth tarmac road, that wouldn't be good because there wouldn't be enough friction, which would mean that your wheels would just spin and you'd have no grip. Now, even the most beautiful Swiss Alpine road isn't actually that smooth. When you look at it up close, like this, you can actually see that it's made up of lots of rough surfaces, lots of peaks and troughs. To an ant, it's like a mountain range. And this is why the compound is so important for grip. If your tire was too hard, it wouldn't deform over this uneven surface, and so the contact patch would be small, just the highlighted areas you can see here. But having a rubber compound that can deform over these road imperfections gives you way more grip. And boom! This is why hysteresis is so important. Hysteresis is one of the main characteristics that's behind a tire compound's performance. But what is hysteresis, I hear you ask? Well, put simply, it's the amount of deformation a tire's rubber compound is capable of, and it's something that changes with respect to temperature, and that is the main reason why we have summer tires and winter tires. When you freeze natural rubber, it becomes brittle and hard, and therefore, in the context of a tire, it can't deform over those imperfections in the road, and therefore you have less contact area and less grip. But tire companies can manipulate and tweak the tire compound so that it's more supple in low temperature, and that's why special compounds are found on winter tires, like this P0, 4S, compared to a summer tyre, which would be a lot stiffer in cold conditions, such as a P0 race. It's also why you hear about motorsport drivers heating up their tyres, because cold tyres, the rubber doesn't deform and therefore it doesn't grip as well. The other thing that impacts grip is adhesion, which is effectively how sticky the tyre compound is, how well it adheres to the road surface. This can be tweaked by, again, manipulating the composition of the tyre compound, but it's also affected by temperature. Hotter rubber is stickier. Now, with regards to the contact patch, you can also increase the size of that by running a lower pressure. This is why in wet conditions, which are a bit more slippy, it's often advised that you run a slightly lower pressure to cause the tyre to deform more over the road surface. This does increase friction though, so it increases your rolling resistance. But to find out the kind of optimal tyre pressures, well Pirelli and Zip have some useful calculators you can check out online to work out what's best for you. But what about tread patterns? Where do they come into this? Well, generally speaking, tread patterns have three key jobs, starting with number one, Stop aquaplaning and evacuate water. Aquaplaning is caused when water fills the little gaps in the tarmac. You can't compress a fluid, says physics, which means that your tire can't conform around the imperfections in the tarmac and therefore can only grip that small top section, meaning grips much less and you're likely to aquaplane. But you don't need to worry about this because bike tires aren't affected by aquaplaning because the contact patch is much narrower and the speeds are much lower. Number two, to give a proper shape to the footprint and better grip when cornering. A groove in the side of the tire, or sipe, to give it its technical name, makes the compound behave in a softer way in that area. This phenomenon is exploited to properly shape the footprint under load. This means you can have a hard compound, which is low rolling resistance, but by sticking a groove in it, it provides some give when you go around corners, allowing it to conform better to the road surface. And number three, to mechanically grip 
the surface that you're riding on. This is mainly important in off-road applications. Now, the main thing to draw from this is that tread patterns are far more important in cars than they are on bikes, but they can still affect your handling on a bike. The grooves can affect the handling of a tire by making a compound appear harder or softer depending on the groove's dimensions and their position relative on the tire. If a compound is stiff, it can behave as a softer one if there are lots of notches, perhaps giving better grip and handling behavior. But on the other hand, if a compound is already soft, too many notches might lead to unpredictable behaviors since the compound is deforming too much. This can also lead to premature wear. When riding off-road, your tires are knobbly or lugged in order to increase the surface area of the contact patch. It can do this because the surface you're riding on can deform and fill all the gaps and grooves on the tire. Off-road tires used on smooth tarmac will have higher rolling resistance due to the unwanted deformation of the, the knobbly bits and smaller contact patch because the road doesn't deform like mud and sand does. Overall, it's important to remember that rolling resistance is just one part of the puzzle in a tire's performance. Grip, the ability to go around corners and have traction are also fundamental. That said, the difference between the worst and the best tires in terms of rolling resistance is often around 20 watts at 40 kilometers an hour, at least. So, well, that's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it informative and useful. Let us know your comments and suggestions down below. Give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And if you wanna check out some amazing documentaries on GCM Plus, well, uh, oh boy, if you like tires, they all have tires in them. Every one, that's a promise. Anyway, I'm going now. Love you, bye.